Hi, I'm Brian Tomasic, and today I'll be talking about the movement to reduce wild animal suffering. So there are a lot of people who have contributed to the cause of researching and um, exploring ways to reduce the suffering of wild animals. Um, I'll focus on my history with the topic, but there are many other people who have also contributed a lot to um, raising awareness and interest. So um, uh, one reason that I have an interest in this topic is that I started as an environmentalist. Um, you can see this picture of me at age four on a tractor. Uh, my family had a small organic farm and um, that my parents were also interested in environmentalism in general. Every summer we went to a conference called the Northeast Organic Farmers Association, um, which was a discussion about organic farming and then related environmental and social issues. Um, when I was a teenager, I was very inspired by Ralph Nader, who um, in 2000 was the Green Party presidential candidate in the US. Um, and I very much was interested in the Green Party and related uh, political activism. Um, and as the name suggests, a main proponent, uh, a main um, component of the Green Party agenda is environmentalism. Um, and in general, I thought I was likely to become an environmental activist when I grew up. Um, this next slide shows an example of one of many letters that I wrote to my congressional representatives in defense of wilderness preservation and um, environmental conservation in general. Um, in high school, I was president of the environmental club um, for three years. And in my, my last few years of school, I tried to encourage the school district to buy 30% recycled paper rather than the 0% recycled paper that they um, bought by default. And um, one thing that I did was try to persuade the school board to pass a policy to um, require the purchase of recycled paper. Um, so that um, proposal didn't pass, but um, the local newspaper, local newspaper wrote an editorial um, in support of uh, what I had tried to do. Um, so that was during high school. And then toward the end of high school in 2005, I um, came across utilitarianism and I looked it up and found some writings on the web um, by Peter Singer, among others. And one that stood out to me was this um, piece, Do Animals Feel Pain? Um, and this was a pretty big revelation to me because until that point, I had assumed that animals were not conscious, probably, um, although I thought it was potentially important to study whether they were. And Singer's um, argument that animals very likely do feel pain combined with his other arguments that um, animal, um, the treatment of animals is actually a serious moral issue opened my eyes to something that I hadn't seen even in progressive politics um, for years before that. Um, so I began reading a lot about animal uh, liberation and animal ethics. Um, in practical ethics, you can see here, um, Singer does mention wild animals briefly. He talks about the question of whether to build a dam. And um, he says that regarding these kinds of calculations, um, the idea of calculating benefits becomes almost absurd with regard to wild animals. Um, and when I read that, I thought maybe it's not so absurd. Maybe we should be including wild animals more, um, doing more to try to include wild animals in our calculations. So I began reading more environmental ethics literature. Um, soon thereafter, I came across this paper on a Bambi, level, a Bambi lover's respect for nature, um, trying to reconcile predation with animal welfare. Um, and initially, I assumed that, that these kinds of arguments were roughly right, namely that um, if you care about animals on the whole, you should try to preserve nature because even though nature contains some bad elements, um, preserving ecosystems is ultimately better for the animals than um, having disrupted ecosystems. Um, and this is because I thought at the time that wild animals probably have net happiness on the whole, 
and therefore it's more important to preserve um, nature than to try to change it um, because changing it would likely disrupt things or lower populations and that would be bad. So initially I thought that concern for animals was consistent with my prior environmentalism. Although I was concerned when I learned that insects might be sentient because um, insects live such short lives and it, be, it looked relatively implausible that insects would have positive lives on balance. Um, so my concerns about the net balance of happiness versus suffering in nature were reinforced in 2006 when I started reading some additional papers on the topic, including Towards Welfare Biology by Yu Kuang Eng. Um, and Eng's um, article lays out the field of welfare biology, which is which aims to assess which animals can feel pain and how much pain versus happiness they feel. And one section of his paper shown here is Proposition 3, the Buddhist premise, suggests that relative to some simplistic assumptions, it seems plausible that total suffering dominates total enjoyment in the wild. Um, and the main idea behind this argument was that most animals have lots of offspring and almost all of them have to die before they reproduce and most of them die quite young. Um, so there's not really much time for happiness. Um, around the same time I was reading the writings of David Pierce, I came across the hedonistic imperative where Pierce also addresses wild animal suffering. Um, he talks here about the horrors of a living world where babies get eaten alive by predators and so on. And so combined with some other um, sources of discussion about this topic, I wrote an, an initial article about wild animal suffering in 2006 and continued um, writing further essays on my website. Um, and so now I'll talk about how this combined with the work of other people has helped to um, snowball into an increasing amount of interest in this topic. So um, I was active on the utilitarian forum called Felicifia, where we discussed many issues, including wild animals, which I brought up. Um, some people there suggested that it might be nice to have a lobby group for wild animal suffering. Um, and um, I and some other friends were interested in creating such a thing as well. Um, meanwhile, Oscar Orta uh, began talking about wild animals. You can see one screenshot from his uh, presentation, but he has also written many papers and recruited people to the movement. Um, and I formed a group on Facebook called Reducing Wild Animal Suffering. Initially, it had a different name, but it was renamed to be more concise. Um, and this has now attracted 1,600 members, and this is where a lot of discussion occurs. Um, and in the last few years, an increasing number of people and organizations have been talking about the issue. There's now a Wikipedia article on wild animal suffering that cites numerous articles and papers. Um, animal Charity Evaluators has a page on wild animal suffering, and many of the staff consider it an important issue to at least consider when deciding what charities to recommend, um, even if it's not a primary focus right now because it's still speculative. Faunalytics recently had two blog posts on the problem of wild animal suffering. Sentience Politics um, has also discussed the issue. As you saw, there was a talk by Ruri Donnelly and Adriano Menino, among other things. So now I'll talk about some different approaches that people can take to addressing the problem and different people prefer different of these approaches based on their circumstances or what they think is most effective. So one approach is to spread awareness in general of how much suffering there is in nature. Um, this is a paper by Oscar Orta um, highlighting the same point that Yu Kuang Eng made about um, how many offspring die young given um, the, the fact that most animals have lots of babies. Um, and the organization Animal Ethics, which was founded by Oscar and colleagues, um, 
make similar points. They have a Facebook page that posts about once a day about um, how wild animals suffer either at human hands or due to natural causes. A second approach is to work in, in philosophy to try to defend the idea of intervening in nature. Um, some philosophers consider nature to be aesthetically valuable or otherwise intrinsically valuable. And so one project is just to defend a more welfareist or um, sentience-centric approach. Um, and also to argue that um, once you agree that wild animal suffering matters, that we also have an obligation to intervene. So there was recently a two-part series in a journal um, relations beyond anthropocentrism, which was entirely devoted to wild animal suffering. A third approach pioneered by David Pierce is to discuss futuristic possibilities for addressing the problem. Um, Pierce has written about the possibilities of biotechnology, nanotech, um, and information technology to um, eventually allow for managing wildlife um, to um, reduce predation and otherwise help animals. Um, and recently, Pierce has also talked about the potential for CRISPR-based gene drives to potentially um, alleviate wild animal suffering. The idea here is that you can, gene drives in principle and soon in practice allow you to spread a desired gene um, change throughout a population of wild um, animals as long as they reproduce sexually. And so um, in principle, one could try to find, for example, genes to reduce pain sensitivity or otherwise um, improve the well-being of wild animals. Um, I'm, I'm more skeptical about this approach because I think people are unlikely to want to do this because it costs a lot of money and um, is risky, but it's something to keep in mind. And it can also help to at least be a proof of concept if you can show that there is, at least in principle, some way that we can help, then that may reduce um, cognitive, bur um, cognitive barriers to caring about animals. It's hard to care about something that can never, in principle, be fixed. Um, a fourth approach is welfare biology research. So this is in the spirit of Yu Kuang Eng's paper. The idea here is to look at what the lives of wild animals are like and try to make some more empirical statements about um, what it's like to be a wild animal, what kinds of things they suffer from, how long they live. So one example is I wrote a paper that fits a curve to the survivorship of di different wild animals based on simple parameters and, and tries to estimate what fraction of animals live for how long and what that implies about total suffering. Um, you can see um, a screenshot from this book, Comparative Ecology, which has a lot of survivorship curves. And so there's a lot of data about um, these kinds of questions. Um, another piece that I wrote is about how much suffering there is at different marine trophic levels. So this is sort of a useful question to ask because it lets you target your interventions um, toward certain groups of animals rather than others. If you think that, for example, the, the lower trophic levels of a food chain have more total suffering than when you're thinking about interventions, um, you'll want to prioritize the effects on those trophic levels. Um, and you can also look at things like how painful is death from starvation, um, maybe also how painful is predation or other kinds of diseases or um, other afflictions that animals experience, as well as what kinds of pleasures they experience. A fifth approach is to look at environmental policy and consumption choices. Um, so this is what I focus on a lot. Um, the idea is that humans already have enormous impacts on wild animal populations. And so it's um, by tweaking the way that we have those impacts, we can potentially reduce a lot of suffering. Um, so here is a list of just a few potential research topics like crop cultivation, climate change, um, biofuel use. Um, and so things that we do every day, like um, which foods we eat or how much energy we use, 
um, make a big difference to wild animals on balance. And um, there seems to be a lot of potential to um, just change personal consumption and then also in the longer term environmental policy with, a, with wild animal welfare in mind. So here I'll discuss just a few issues that um, a few examples of what you can do in the field of evaluating environmental policy. So um, this slide shows the Living Planet Index, which is compiled by the Worldwide Fund for Nature and uh, associated researchers. And it tries to provide something like a stock index of wildlife. So basically they take a weighted average of wild animal populations of different types. And um, on the whole, the Living Planet Index has declined by something like half since 1970. Um, and so roughly you can interpret that as saying that vertebrate uh, wild animals have declined by about half. Um, although there may be some methodology issues here and maybe it, um, like it might tr give too much weight to uh, big wild animals rather than small wild animals or something, but um, at least it provides some reasonable evidence of what the total impact of humanity's existence has been for wild animals. And th the next slide shows a similar set of data for um, invertebrates. A study uh, published in Science in 2004 showed that invertebrates have on the whole declined. Um, and a similar in index of invertebrate abundance also showed roughly a half decline in the last 40 years. Um, and so if you think that suffering dominates happiness in nature, especially among small animals like insects, um, this is a bit of good news and it can um, suggest other potential interventions. So one thing to think about is the interaction between global health and wild animal suffering. So um, the Against Malaria Foundation is one example that's well known in effective altruist circles. And by um, reducing malaria um, deaths, it's plausible that the Against Malaria Foundation helps to increase the human population. Um, of course, um, the people in the developing world probably have less environmental impact per person than people in the developed world. But assuming that people in the developing world still reduce wild animal suffering on balance, then it's plausible that unincreased population in the developing world would continue to uh, reduce wild animal suffering. And um, so I give one very rough back of the envelope calculation suggesting that maybe each dollar donated to against malaria foundation could reduce something like 10,000 or something like 20,000 insect years of suffering, um, which translates into more than that many insect deaths because um, insects usually live less than one year. Um, so there's uh, a lot of uncertainty in this number. Um, one reason is that some have suggested that um, it's possible that higher malaria actually increases population growth and thus lowering malaria would reduce population growth. And the idea here is if families have enough, make, have enough children to make sure that they have um, a few surviving children, then they might actually overcompensate for the malaria and have um, more total children due to higher mortality rates. Um, and so if that's true, then what I said in the previous slide would, would reverse. Um, so there seems to be a lot of um, room to better explore um, these kinds of issues in international health, uh, like what is the net impact of international health interventions on the human population? And then also what is the, the sign of the impact of human population on wild animal suffering? Um, but it suggests that there's at least some interesting questions to explore and the potential for um, interventions that would reduce wild animal suffering that might actually be also good for other reasons. A sixth approach to reducing wild animal suffering is to argue against spreading it to further places on earth. Um, so one example of this is rewilding, which is um, in some cases an attempt to um, increase the animal populations or otherwise the, um, the wilderness of certain areas. And um, insofar as this um, 
causes there to exist more wild animals, then this is plausibly harmful. Um, and because it's an active intervention that um, changes things from the way they are, it's also um, maybe easier to argue against. Um, so there are two different organizations here that work on rewilding, but there are many more people interested in the topic. A seventh approach is to oppose the spread of wild animals, not just on Earth, but also in space. So these are more futuristic scenarios and they're not um, going to happen anytime soon. But if we start talking about them, then we may eventually be able to change the long term trajectory. So one possibility is terraforming, where you make a planet more Earth-like in, in terms of its atmosphere and other um, composition. And then in the long term, you could spread plants and maybe animals. Um, and it's not sure, uh, people are not sure whether it would work and like it might take thousands of years. Um, so it's not really clear if it'll ever happen, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, there's this Society for Life in Space, um, and you can see on their um, logo, the human purpose is to spread life, um, to propagate life, and they're an organization interested in what's called directed panspermia, which is deliberately seeding um, life throughout space with the hope that it will take root on some planets somewhere. Um, and you can see an article title here that one professor thinks that we have a moral obligation to spread life throughout the universe. So um, there are many people who presumably don't think about wild animal suffering when they're making these kinds of moral statements or don't value it enough. Um, so it can be important to challenge those kinds of attitudes. Um, and one other way that wild animal suffering might be spread in the far future is by simulations. Um, so in superintelligence, Nick Bostrom mentions wild animal suffering briefly when he mentions that um, if you run evolutionary simulations to develop superintelligence, then you might reproduce a lot of Darwinian misery in the process. Um, and similarly, once a superintelligence has begun to colonize space, it might want to run even more simulations in order to learn about biology or whether there are extraterrestrials um, or answer other kinds of questions. And this is true both for human controlled AIs as well as uncontrolled AIs, like a so-called paperclip maximizing AI would still probably have incentive to run wild animal simulations. Um, so um, this is a, a concern that we can address in a few different ways. One is to ask the question of whether a controlled or an uncontrolled AI would run more such simulations. And that seems to be non-obvious to me because one uh, reason an uncontrolled AI might run more simulations is that it just doesn't have ethical constraints. Um, if it finds them useful for scientific reasons, it will run even the worst simulations um, to learn more about the universe. Um, but on the other hand, human humans tend to be more interested in wildlife and animal-like minds in general. So it's possible that a human controlled uh, galactic civilization would run more wilderness simulations for entertainment or intrinsic value or other reasons. Um, we already do have video games that simulate wild, wildlife or um, games where you can play a predator eating prey. And that's not to mention um, many other video games where um, the whole um, purpose is to kill other creatures. Um, even if they're not strictly um, biological wild animals. Um, so it's, it's not really certain um, which kinds of future civilizations would have the most wild animal suffering, but we can think more about that question and then push, um, um, uh, push in directions that maybe would have less uh, suffering. Um, and then one other thing is that if humans do control the future of artificial general intelligence, it's important that they care about this issue. So um, assuming that a future AI does embody human values to some extent, that's a reason to make human values more concerned about this issue um, so that the amount of simulations, especially the worst kinds of simulations is reduced. 
So um, I'll end by talking about getting involved. Um, one, one organization working on this issue, as I mentioned, is Animal Ethics. Um, but I'll talk more about uh, my organization, which is the Foundational Research Institute. And so we look at many different questions, not just wild animal suffering, but also suffering in general that might result from AI scenarios. Um, we research suffering-focused ethical views like prioritarianism, negative utilitarianism, um, and other um, ethical approaches that give special weight to suffering, um, and some other issues here as well, like anthropics, um, cooperation. And um, in particular, we're looking for someone who's interested in researching wild animal suffering, especially with a focus on environmental policy, but also um, looking into the other kinds of issues that I talked about. And um, if you're interested, um, slide 30 has a email address um, to send along an email to tell us that you're interested. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. Um, this last slide has a, a little squirrel in a tree saying thanks. So now I guess we'll have some questions. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, so first of all, are there any questions from people here? Maybe people who have to leave soon? Hi, Brian. Um, my name's Leon. Uh, Hi. My question is, g'day. Um, so my question is, uh, a lot of the, the sort of computations in this area seem crucially to depend on the idea that a, that a given animal's life, particularly if it dies young, is a net negative in terms of suffering, especially if you're, you're not a negative utilitarian. Um, and it's, it seems like some of the conclusions could almost be, be kind of drastically reversed, depending on which way you think that goes. So I'm wondering what the main line or lines of argument are for that, apart from or perhaps in addition to just the, the sort of K versus R selection type arguments? Well, yeah, I guess it is still, um, maybe you can turn off the mic uh, between. Yeah, so it is, I think that is the main argument. Basically, the idea would be that um, even if life is somewhat good before you die, the process of dying tends to be painful in most cases. And if you only live, say, a few weeks, um, many people would avoid a few weeks of happy life, um, would give up a few weeks of happy life to avoid the pain of dying. Um, and then there's the further point that even during a life, it's not obvious. Um, the average experiences are not all obviously positive because there is hunger and um, disease and parasitism and things like that. Um, but I do agree that especially if you value happiness a lot, then it could be worth researching more um, what the balance of happiness versus suffering is for different species. Uh, anyone else? Um, so I have a question um, that sort of follows on. Um, so a lot of these arguments are premised on uh, making assumptions uh, and arguments about the experiences of animals and uh, insects, which by their nature are very dissimilar to our own experiences. Um, to what extent do you think this sort of reasoning can be extended? So like, what is the limit to saying, um, well, if, if humans suffer, it's quite likely that, you know, monkeys suffer and that insects have similar biology enough that there's probably some suffering involved in their lives. Can this be extended to um, like plants, for example, or large groups of individuals in some sort of hive mind situation? Or do you think that this kind of consideration is just too insignificant to really come into the calculation, if that makes sense? So I guess there are two questions. Um, are you asking about uh, whether we can infer that they have any consciousness or whether we can infer the quality of that consciousness based on analogy or both? Uh, both, whether we can infer they have any consciousness um, and whether if 
that's of a very minimal level, whether we should care about that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, people disagree on this question. My own view is that um, consciousness is something that we attribute to different physical processes, including ourselves. Um, and so there's not a right answer about what types of beings are conscious. Um, but I think a plausible way to um, make up an answer to this question is to um, say that consciousness correlates with the complexity and self-reflection and um, agent-like behavior of a system. So from that perspective, you could say that any physical system maybe has a non-zero degree of consciousness. Um, this is panpsychism, and it's embraced by some neuroscientists like um, Christoph Koch, among others. And um, so from that perspective, um, plants would matter and hive minds would matter and so on, but there's still the question of how, how much weight to give different things. From an emotional standpoint, I tend to give animals a lot more weight than plants or like the United States as a, a mind of its own. Um, but certainly people could disagree with that. Um, and if you take a different view that consciousness is an objective property that either exists or not, then you, you would reach similar kinds of conclusions because there's some probability that plants can suffer and maybe that probability is similar to the weight that um, a non-realist like me would give to, to plant consciousness. So um, it seems that you are forced to care to some degree either way. Um, and at least if you consider small probabilities. So then as far as the quality of their consciousness, um, I agree that we can't um, be confident in our um, extrapolations, even with other people, people experience different situations differently, have different pain sensitivities and so on. And then um, the farther we get from mammals, um, the worse the extrapolations will become. Um, but for one thing, um, extrapolations are better than nothing. And then the second point is that we can also use other criteria, like at least to determine what is painful for a given organism, we can look at its behavioral responses. And in principle, in the future, it's um, neural responses um, at, a, at a finer level. Um, so um, those, those can be useful for determining um, how animals suffer in response to what conditions. And so you could look at like the typical life of an animal and see what fraction of the time aversive um, behavior or neural processing is activated, at least in principle in the long term. Um, but as far as the question of what the net balance is, I think net balance of happiness versus suffering is, I think that's always gonna be something of a value judgment based on what weight you place on different experiences and how you add them together. Thanks. Um, yeah. Hey, Brian. Uh, hey. Um, so I think one of the people here mentioned that you had strategies to avoid suffering. For example, not driving your car at night because it would kill more insects. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So also, if you judge that insects on average lead a less happy life than not, then wouldn't it be better to drive your car at night so you'll kill as many as possible because otherwise they'll starve to death? and killing them on your car is presumably fairly fast unless you injure them and then they don't die. Yeah, so um, my, my thoughts on this are unclear and I think this is one of many questions that deserves further research. So my, um, my reason for caution about the argument that you just made is um, many ecosystems are what's called bottom-up limited and that means that um, the total population of organisms is determined by the amount of food or other limiting resources. And so it might be that if you um, kill one insect, then in the long term, someone else will eat the same food that it would have been, that it would have eaten or occupy the same space or use the other resources. So it's not obvious that killing any given animal will reduce the long term populations. Um, but killing does um, cause one extra death sooner than it would have happened otherwise. And so insofar as it's death is painful, then that increases the number of painful deaths per unit time. Um, that argument would apply less strongly if the car is um, really does kill the insect almost instantly. I, I don't 
have data on what fraction of insects die how quickly after a car collision um, but at least for um, insects on the road um, i often see that many worms and slugs are only half crushed by cars um, and so that seems like a pretty bad death um, and the, in comparison um, we we mentioned starvation as one way that they might die otherwise um, it's not clear to me how bad starvation is i recently wrote a piece um, in the case of humans that some humans choose to end their own lives at, when they're old by voluntary starvation and dehydration um, and many report that it's um, not too bad all, all things considered um, it's not clear how to extend that to insects or to healthy young animals but um, that's one reason to think that starvation might not be vastly worse than other ways of dying or maybe might be even better than other ways of dying um, so as far as um, recommendations that I gave some some other ones that I'll just mention are um, you can re avoid uh, buying silk because the process of silk production requires boiling several um, thousands of um, silkworms alive per um, pound of silk um, produced. Um, shellac is an ingredient in um, it's basically pharmaceutical glaze or sometimes used in uh, wood finishings and other things. And um, that is made from lac bugs um, and tens of thousands of lac bugs need to, um, are, are used to produce a single pound of shellac. Um, and then other things that are maybe common sense like um, keeping insects out of your house to, um, that probably reduces insect populations on the whole, especially if you have like ants eating your food, then um, assuming that food would not be eaten by insects otherwise, then having ants increases the total insect population. Um, Hi. Um, I saw the part um, where you were you had a graph about the total population um, uh, decreasing in the last 40 years. And it was initially counterintuitive to me that um, this population decrease was uh, potentially actually beneficial from the point of view of wild animal suffering, because most people um, regard uh, decreases in population as of wild animals to be a bad thing. So. If we extend this and hypothetically could um, cause the extinction of of a population or all populations of wild animals and still um, say survive, humans could survive potentially on um, on plants or something like that. Then could this be like? Is this morally uh, a correct action to? to pursue since um, we're, we're saying that the lives of these animals overall have a negative um, negative utility? Um, yeah, people disagree on the answer to that. So one, one point to make is that even if you think total elimination of wildlife would be a bad thing, um, you could still think that on the margin, reductions in wildlife could be a good thing. Um, for example, if you intrinsically value species or intrinsically value that there are at least some animals in the wild, then you could still be on board with reducing populations. Um, and in practice, um, in the short run, we won't ever eliminate all wildlife. So it's the, the relevant issue is on the margin. Um, but from a more theoretical perspective, um, I don't see an intrinsic reason that it would be bad to eliminate wildlife, assuming they're net negative. Um, and like we can potentially replace them with better things. So if, if you think about science fiction scenarios that may not be so unrealistic, like the eventual rise of digital intelligence on Earth, maybe even within the next hundred years or at least the next thousand years, um, then digital intelligence doesn't need even plants. It just needs like solar power or some other form of energy and um, building materials. So um, assuming as seems plausible that eventually the dominant intelligence on earth will become digital, 
it's possible that the biosphere will be eliminated anyway, um, unless people have an intrinsic desire to preserve it. Um, but doing that won't eliminate intelligence or um, even consciousness. Um, so um, not only is it um, conceivable, but I think it's actually fairly likely that what you discussed will happen eventually. Hi, Brian. I have two kind of unrelated questions with one another. Uh, number one, so when you're trying to alleviate suffering in the wild, um, a lion will eat another animal and in trying to alleviate the suffering of one, you take away the food source of the other. So is that causing suffering or what do you feed them instead? And the second question is, uh, within the human population, if we don't even care as, as human species, non-wild animals, so factory farming and et cetera, and they're suffering, how likely is it that people will start caring about the wild suffering of animals? So as far as the first question, um, so one point to make is that a lion kills more prey than uh, like many prey. And so um, like one lion um, starving to death would um, allow for maybe tens, I don't know the exact numbers of prey animals not to be eaten. Um, and so even if you give lions more moral weight because they're maybe more intelligent than prey, it seems like a reasonable trade-off. But um, that's sort of as, at a theoretical level, but it becomes a more complicated question whether to actually reduce predator populations because um, that can have tro uh, trophic cascades in the ecosystem where you increase um, lower level trophic, pop um, the population one trophic level down and the overall consequences are not always clear. And that's especially true if the ecosystem has many different levels of predation like is true in the oceans. Um, so it's may maybe that reducing large predator fish um, increases populations of smaller predator fish and that reduces populations of the lower level fish or something like that. Um, and so one would have to look in more detail at the specific flow, flow on effects of a given change like that. Um, and for that reason, I think focusing on land use changes, which reduce the amount of primary productivity in an ecosystem, like the amount of plants and therefore the amount of animals that the whole ecosystem can support are more um, robust in their effects because um, if you change the amount of overall plant growth in an area, then it seems more likely that you'll change the amount of overall animals in the area in the long term. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's better to focus on those more clear interventions like um, land use change. Um, although um, eliminating predators can in some cases cause land use change. For example, the classic um, illustration of this is uh, Yellowstone where when wolves were reintroduced, um, the elk ate less vegetation and therefore vegetation increased. Um, and so if you reverse that, you could say that eliminating predators would likely cause more large herbivores to exist and therefore reduce plant uh, growth. And that might be a good thing from this perspective that um, if, if large, more case selected herbivores are eating plants, then maybe fewer insects since other smaller animals will be eating the plants and therefore you might reduce total suffering because the same amount of food is feeding fewer and fewer animals and animals that have better lives. Um, then as far as the second point, um, so yeah, many people do think that promoting concern for wild animal suffering should be part of an overall anti-speciesist um, message. And in the past, I um, thought that like veg outreach could, uh, vegetarian outreach could even be um, one way to help wild animals because um, by increasing concern for farmed animals in, in the long term that could spill over into concern for wild animals. Um, one concern that I have with this approach now is um, it seems as though many vegans and animal advocates um, assume that the wilderness is net good. Um, and so this can, um, their support for environmentalism could be on intrinsic grounds like um, 
humans only have a duty to stop uh, interfering with animals and it's not our business to intervene um, or even what happens in nature is intrinsically valuable. Um, or it could be from the more empirical um, assumption that um, even if you care about just animal welfare, um, it's often assumed that wild animals are net happy, especially because people tend to focus on the larger vertebrates and ignore high infant mortality. So um, unless that trend changes, then it, it becomes more worrisome to promote generic animal rights without including a message about wild animal suffering because it might, because just branding generic animal rights might even increase um, environmentalism and might have negative effects for wild animals in the long term. So for that reason, I tend to um, focus on wild animal, the wild animal message specifically because um, first of all, just it's more neglected. So there seem to be higher returns from doing that. But then also if you don't couple anti-speciesism with concern for wild animals, then, um, and, and appreciation of the amount of suffering in nature, then anti-speciesism alone might have negative effects. Okay, so I think we had a question over here. Hi, Brian. Um, Hi. My question, so when I hear talking about all this stuff, the main thing that I notice is that just how uncertain I am about, you know, uh, the relative importance of, say, insects. And uh, what, what I think about this argument that since there's so much death, that means it must be, so overall it must all be negative. Um, which means it's very hard to sort of support any specific policies on that basis. I was wondering if you had specific things which would be more robust to at least some of these sort of uncertainties. Right, not uncertainties in terms of what the effects of our actions would be, but uncertainties in terms of what we should even be aiming for. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, it how much uncertainty there is depends on uh, your moral views. So, I guess as far as the happiness versus suffering question, if you care more about suffering um, because you're a prioritarian or like um, want to ma maximize the worst off individuals or a negative utilitarian or otherwise, then it becomes more clear that um, focusing on reducing the badness in nature is important. But it is true that for many people, the trade-off is a little bit less clear. Um, and then also the question of insects versus big animals. Um, I also struggle with exactly how, how to trade those two off. Um, so, as far as robust interventions, um, I guess um, one one possibility is uh, replacing more R selected creatures with more K selected creatures. And so, one example of that is what we talked about before with um, having more big herbivores might displace many more small animals. Um, so, that could be good if you think that um, the total amount of sentience of the two is equal, but the big animals have better lives. Um, but if you don't think this amount of sentience is equal, then it might not be equal, and it might be either good or bad, um, depending on um, the balance of happiness versus suffering, and also uh, um, which, whether insects or big animals have more sentience. Um, I guess, um, Promoting concern for the issue in general can be somewhat robust because that allows future generations or even present generations um, in the coming years to do more research and better figure out how to tackle the problem. Um, although promoting concern is also likely to, to change environmental policies, not just to develop um, improved knowledge of the situation. So um, that's not free from um, Kind of uh, uncertain side effects either, um, but maybe that would be close to the best thing, like promoting general research on animal welfare in the wild and um, trying to um, like weigh how good versus bad lives are and, and um, have more people think about how to make these trade-offs. Um, 
without taking specific interventions. From my perspective, I favor taking interventions because the moral importance of preventing suffering is more clear for me. And um, I think we can have more impact by doing that. So, hi. Um, so you were talking about the simulations earlier and um, how a super intelligence could um, make simulations of um, of animals. Um, I haven't. I don't really know a lot about this topic, so you might need to um, might need to give a bit of background explanation, I guess. But um, say in our current video games, we have simulations of people like in a war zone where the the aim of the player is to shoot another uh, computer player, for instance. But um, I haven't heard any philosophers uh, being concerned about the welfare of these computer players getting shot. But in a super intelligence, then you seem to suggest that we would be concerned about simulated animals having suffering. So can you sort of draw a distinction as to why we are worried about these simulated animals and how they could actually have like some sort of consciousness or or suffering potentially yeah so the main um, reason that i think many people might eventually come to care about elaborate wild animal simulations is that they would be more complex than present day video games so in order to enhance the suppose we're thinking about a virtual reality of the far future in the next thousand years or something if there are still agents like humans that enjoy playing um, games in these kinds of environments or maybe intrinsically value creating these kinds of environments for environmentalist reasons, um, then they could have much more elaborate agents than today's video games. So um, in order to make the behavior of an animal more lifelike, you need to um, have more of the kind of cognitive complexity that an actual animal has. So if you think about um, evolution, evolution has likely optimized animals to have fairly efficient brains in order to carry out the tasks that they do. And if there were more efficient, easily accessible ways um, to perform the same behavior across a wide range of environments, then animals should have evolved simpler brains for that reason. So. Um, unless there are very different algorithms that we haven't come across, it seems as though you would need something like an animal brain to fully simulate the um, range of complex behaviors that actual animals exhibit. Um, so if you want a very lifelike simulation, then you'd need maybe some kind of simulation that's um, quite similar to an animal brain, at least in its functional behavior, if not its exact um, underlying architecture. Um, so, and the, the viewpoint in philosophy of mind called functionalism would say that, um, in general, the, the functional behavior of a system is what determines whether it has a mind. Um, and so from that perspective, um, like something that can, can mimic an animal to a high degree of accuracy would probably have similar moral status as an actual biological animal. Um, and so the reason you'd need high fidelity simulations would be either to make the video games more interesting um, or um, if you're doing science, like if you're studying the emergence of life on extraterrestrial planets, then you would also want very accurate simulations, at least in some cases, um, because that makes the simulation more accurate. And if you're thinking about an AI that has um, like millions uh, of planets at its disposal um, that can all be converted into computing power around their stars, then um, running complex simulations, at least um, to some degree, might be um, quite possible. I think we've got one more question and then we might wrap it up.
Uh, uh, so, hey, Brian. I was just wondering, I didn't get a chance to look at the other resources before the talk, but apparently there's a guy called PZ Myers who was uh, contradicting your point of view. I was just wondering what you think his strongest, he or she's strongest argument is against your your viewers and whether you've got a defense against it. So um, I don't remember the article in detail, but it was um, against the um, piece by Will and Amanda McCaskill suggesting that um, the death of Cecil the lion may have prevented many prey deaths and from that perspective had some upside to it. Um, so um, I think his ar argument, as best I recall, was basically the, the usual reply that ecosystems are very complicated and um, it's hard to tell what would happen if we intervene. Um, and um, maybe something else along the lines of um, it's natural for animals to suffer. Um, so my main reply to that is if we think about the kinds of interventions that I think are most feasible, like um, changing which kinds of crops are grown or um, um, looking at the net impact of climate change or um, other kinds of land use changes that humans do. These are things that we're already doing on a massive scale. And so at least in the short term, the effects are not very unclear. Like it, it's fairly well understood what happens when you convert land to grow crops or when you grow different kinds of crops. And we have a lot of data on the abundances of different animals in different kinds of ecosystems. Um, you could still make the argument that on a global scale, especially when you're thinking about climate change, the long-term impacts may be less clear. Um, but um, that doesn't mean we should give up. I mean, because even not acting is also a choice. And so the, the, the issue is just to figure out which form of action is the, be the better one to take. Um, so that the uncertainty points toward the need for more research rather than picking implicitly picking one action, which is inaction rather than other actions. Um, and especially given the numbers of wild animals, it seems like even if there's a lot of uncertainty, the expected impact that we can have is quite large. All right. Um, thank you very much, Brian, for your time and a really interesting discussion. Um, just give a quick round of applause. Um, and if there's nothing else you'd like to add, um, we'll leave it there. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.